So we learned that a compressor and a limiter are tools that we can use to reduce the dynamic range of an audio signal. So how does a compressor and a limiter affect the dynamic range? Both tools are very similar in how they work. We can think of these tools as something we can use to automatically control the volume of an audio signal, similar to how you would use your fader to control the volume of an audio track. When the volume is too high, we bring down the fader to lower the volume. When we play our snare sample, we have the attack or transient, which is high in volume, and the decay, which gets softer in volume as time passes. If we instantaneously turn down the volume of our fader when the transient is played, and gradually raise it back up to the normal volume as the decay fades out, we've essentially built our own compressor. Let's go ahead and try that. But that's a lot of work in order to control the volume. So that's why we have compressors and limiters, which can automatically do that for us. So let's go ahead and insert the compressor plugin. We'll go into inserts, dynamics, and compressor. We'll double click to open it up. And we'll start by resetting all of our controls. We'll set the threshold to zero, the ratio to one. We'll turn off our soft knee, our auto makeup gain. We'll turn our attack to 0.1. We'll change our hold to zero. We'll change the release to 10. And we'll change our analysis from RMS to peak. And I'll go ahead and give you a few seconds to copy my settings if you're following along. To the right side of the compressor, we'll see three meters. The input meter shows us the level coming into the compressor. The GR or gain reduction meter shows us how much we're reducing the volume, and our output meter shows us the level of our audio after the compressor has reduced the volume. And we also have peak meters at the bottom of each one. The threshold is the control that tells the compressor the level that it should start detecting the audio, and the ratio tells the compressor how much it needs to reduce the gain. We can think of the threshold also as the sensitivity of the compressor. Any audio that peaks below the threshold will be ignored, and any audio that peaks above the threshold will be affected by the compressor. We have another audio sample that we'll be using to describe these two settings. It's a one kilohertz sine wave that peaks at minus 12 dB. If we play it back on the compressor, you'll notice that both our input and output meters read peaks at minus 12 dB. So on our input, we'll see minus 12 dB. On our output, we'll see minus 12 dB. Now that we know what our threshold does, we have to set it to a level that's below minus 12 dB. For now, we'll set it to minus 14 dB, which means that our incoming audio will be 2 dB above the threshold. At this point, our compressor won't affect the audio without us setting the ratio. We can think of the ratio as how far we turn the fader down when a loud signal passes through. The higher the ratio, the more we pull down the fader. We'll start by setting our ratio to 2. This is referred to as a 2 to 1 ratio. What this tells us is that for every 2 dB of audio that exceeds our threshold, it will only allow 1 dB of audio to be output above the limit set by our threshold. We can also think of this as a fraction by dividing 1 by 2, which is 1 half. So for every 1 dB that exceeds our threshold, it will only allow a half a dB out. So you can see that with a ratio of 2 to 1, we're simply having the volume of the audio signal that exceeds our threshold. And being that our signal exceeds the threshold by 2 dB, 1 half of 2 dB is 1 dB. So our output meter should read something close to minus 13 dB, and our gain reduction meter should read something close to 1 dB. So let's go ahead and play our sample back again and check out our meters. And first we'll reset those peaks by clicking on each one. So you can see here, our input meter read minus 12 dB, which was the level of our incoming audio. Our gain reduction read minus 0.9, and our output meter read minus 12.8. Now these numbers aren't exact because of some other inconsistencies in regards to the other settings, but we're very close. Let's see what happens if we change our ratio to 4 to 1. So remember, now what we're doing is telling the compressor that for every 4 dB of audio that exceeds the threshold, it will only output 1 dB of audio above the threshold. We can also divide 1 by 4, which gives us 1 quarter. So for every dB that exceeds our threshold, the compressor will only let out 1 quarter of the volume. Since we still have our threshold set to minus 14, and we'll be exceeding the threshold by 2 dB, this tells us that we should now only be 0.5 dB above our threshold. So our output meter should be close to minus 13.5, 
and our gain reduction should be close to 2.5. We'll go ahead and reset our peaks and we'll play the sample back to see how close we are. So if we move our threshold down to minus 16 dB, this will give us 4 dB of audio that exceeds our threshold limit. If we keep our ratio set to 4 to 1, 1 quarter of 4 is 1 dB. So now our output meter should read minus 15 dB, which is 1 dB above the threshold, and our gain reduction meter should read 3. Okay, so moving forward, let's take a look at our makeup gain control. Now that we know how a compressor reduces the volume of an audio signal, we'll need to make up for that volume loss by boosting the volume again. And this is what our makeup gain control does. So let's go ahead and bring up our control room mixer again. We'll reset the values, and we'll move back to our snare sample. First, we'll bypass the compressor, and we'll take a look at our peak and RMS values. So we have our original peak of minus 5.4 and our RMS value of minus 25.2. Now if we enable the compressor and reset our meters again, we'll go ahead and play it back and see what our readings are. So you can see the compressor has actually reduced our peak value and our RMS value. Now there's a few different ways we can effectively use the makeup gain control setting. If we want to increase the loudness of our sample without running into the risk of clipping, what we'll need to do is take the difference between our input peak value and our output peak value. In this case, it's 6.8 dB. So if we enter 6.8 into the makeup gain section, we should now see that our peak should be very close to our original, which would be minus 5.4. But now you'll notice that our RMS value is a lot higher than it was previously at 28. So you'll notice that if we first bypass the compressor and then listen to the compressed signal, that the compressed signal sounds much louder even though it's not exceeding the original peak volume. And this is because we've reduced the dynamic range and increased our RMS value, which increases our perceived loudness without running into the risk of clipping. So let's reset our meters and go ahead and check that out. First we'll play it bypassed. We'll enable our compressor again. So you can see how this is useful in order to give an audio signal a sense of power. We can increase our perceived loudness of the signal without actually increasing the peak volume. The other way that we can use our makeup gain control is to try to match the loudness level, which is our RMS value. And being that the RMS is a calculation that goes over time, there really isn't an efficient way to calculate this in order to introduce our makeup gain. We'll just need to move this value and play it by ear. But luckily, this compressor actually has a button for auto makeup gain. And this is what the auto makeup gain control does. It lets us reduce our dynamic range while keeping the same loudness level. It does, however, reduce our peak. So in the case that you're wanting to use a compressor without affecting our perceived loudness, we can enable this auto makeup gain and it will automatically do it for us. So let's go ahead and bypass our compressor. We'll play it back and then we'll enable the compressor to see what the difference is. You can see that there isn't really a difference in the volume of the audio, even though that we've reduced the dynamic range. So for now, we'll go ahead and disable our auto makeup gain and move on to our next control, which is the attack. The attack setting tells the compressor how fast it will start compressing our audio after a transient has passed the threshold. The longer the attack, the slower the compressor is to respond to those incoming transients. The easy way to remember the attack setting is it will make your transients sound like they have more of an attack. And when using this value, we really have to be careful about how we set our makeup gain. Being that the initial transients of the signal will pass through the compressor, it's important to take note of our input and output meters before we adjust the makeup gain. So let's go ahead and reduce our makeup gain to zero again, and we'll change the attack setting so that you can see what it sounds like. So you can hear with longer attack times, we let more of this initial transient signal through the compressor. And if we play it once again, just be sure to check out the output meter to see how the attack has an effect on our output. So 
So you can see that by increasing our attack time, it has let more of that initial peak value through. And this is why we wait till the end to change our makeup gain. If we left our makeup gain at 6.8 as it was in the previous example, you'll see that we would then be clipping at plus 1.0 dp. So let's go ahead and bring our attack to 0.1 again, and we'll take a look at what the release control does. If we go back to our original fader example, the release control tells us how fast we're going to move the fader back up after the transient has hit the compressor. After the transient hits the compressor, the part of the compressor that detects the transient doesn't immediately move back up to zero gain reduction. So the release tells us how many milliseconds it will take to recover from the initial gain reduction. We can see an example of this if we duplicate our snare sample a few times. Now let's slowly increase the release time to see what effect it has on the second, third, and fourth transients. We can hear even a better example of that if we reduce our makeup gain, our threshold, and increase the attack a little bit. So you should have been able to immediately notice that as we increased our release time, the compressor was slower to detect the transients on the second, third, and fourth sample. But after the fourth sample, it had enough time to recover so that we were able to pick up our initial transient on the first sample again. And when we reduced our release time, it was able to pick up the transient on every single sample. So the attack and release times have a direct effect on how fast our compressor works to detect the audio. Our release control also has an auto button which we can enable where it will automatically detect the decay of the audio signal. The hold setting isn't common on many compressors, so this is something that we would want to adjust sparingly. It can create some intense pumping effects which could be useful in certain scenarios. What happens is that when the transient triggers the gain reduction, the hold setting we can think of as kind of a pause button for the gain reduction. So once the transient triggers the gain reduction, the hold button will pause that gain reduction for a certain amount of time before it will release. So we'll take a quick look at what that control sounds like. So you can see in this case where the hold and the release play a similar role, except that the hold will hold our gain reduction for a longer period of time before the recovery is introduced. Our knee setting is what gives our compressor a softer sound, hence the term soft knee. The knee is the point at the threshold where the compressor starts reducing the gain. It gives the compressor a more gradual introduction into reducing the gain and can give the compressor effect a softer sound. Some useful examples of this would be when we're compressing audio that doesn't have harsh transients, like vocals, strings, or synthesizer pad sounds. So let's take a quick look at a vocal example to see how the soft knee affects the attack of the vocal. First we'll turn soft knee off, and then we'll enable it. Now it's a subtle effect, but you can hear how it softens out that initial attack and gives it a more natural sound. And this brings us to our last setting, which is the analysis. And this tells the threshold at which peak it will start detecting the signal. Setting the compressor to detect at peak will typically work better for hard transient sounds, and setting it to RMS will typically work better for softer sounds like vocals. However, there are no hard and fast rules as to which setting to use, so sometimes it can be worth the time to experiment. In my experience, the RMS setting has a tendency of creating a smoother sound without making the audio sound squashed from the compressor. So in the event you aren't looking for an obvious compressed sound, try moving the setting more towards the RMS side. Let's see what effect it has on our snare sample. You can hear that by moving it to RMS it does give us an overall smoother sound. So that's all for compression. Join us in the next video where we start talking about limiting.